Shane Newman. This episode we film in live from Chuya Athletics. It's the first episode that I'm able to film inside my baseball training facility. So it's pretty cool to be able to do that. Uh, on this show, I got joining me a longtime friend of mine, been knowing him for about 10 plus years. Uh, the kid is from South Central LA. I guess now it's called South LA. They changed it up a little bit. Former big league outfielder, turned author, uh, dreadlock roster, Mr. Brian Barton. B, what's going on, bro? What's up, Shane, man? It's good to be here. Man, I'm glad you was able to hop on. I've been chasing you for a while to get on the show, bro. You've been all over the world traveling and doing your thing. So I'm happy that you're able to kind of just settle down and take some time out for the small people, bro, and hop on the League Talk podcast. Well, you know how they say, man. Sometimes you got to play hard to get. And I can't make it <laughs> before you. I feel you, bro. I feel you, man. Again, like I said, it's cool, bro. And then, you know, with you, bro, we're going to hop into your career. But first and foremost, how that how that journey started in baseball, growing up in the L.A. area. A lot of lot of lot of good base, a lot of great baseball players came up around around your time, a little bit before you, a little bit after you. So we're going to speak on that and just talk about that journey, man, uh, to the big leagues and, and jump into the two books that you've written over the last couple of years as well as what you're doing now. So, man, just speak on how you got started in the game uh, once you started playing baseball growing up. Man, I pretty much started like everybody else, man. It all started in the neighborhoods. Believe it or not, I started out playing basketball growing up in L.A. Everybody pretty much grew up big time Laker fans, especially watching yeah. Magic and Kareem and all those guys play. So everybody wanted to play like them, be like them. You know, I had the little purple and yellow Converse. Used to wear my <laughs> the throwbacks, high knees, and my brother and I we used to always at halftime run into the backyard and play a quick little game of fifty before Lakers come back out and finish the game up. And you know, really, basketball was like my first love. I loved it. That's all I did was play it. And I still remember that one time in Inglewood, California, we had rolled by this little league park, and I remember seeing this like caricature of a of a baseball player, this cartoon, and it was a black it was a black pitcher. And I remember telling my dad, like, Dad, I want to play baseball. And the unfortunate part was that he made me make a decision. Oh, said, well, already? At a young age like that? At a young age, man. He was like, if you want to play baseball, you can't play basketball. And I was like, dang, right? Because, you know, back in those days, a lot of people in inner city, you know, we had to make those financial decisions. And the real decision was a money thing. You know, yeah. I couldn't afford to play both or we couldn't afford to play both. So I just said, hey, I want to play baseball. Let me play. And little did I know that baseball was going to end up being the love of my life and the bread, the breadwinner for me. And from that from that point, my dad got me a glove and it was like love at first sight. And I grew up an avid Dodger fan, obviously, like I said, Laker fan. I remember my grandfather used to always take us to the Dodger games along with my dad as well. And baseball was just so fun. It was like such a pure sport and being around a bunch of players that looked like me too. Yeah. Man, it was, it, was, it was awesome. I know we got a bunch of mutual friends that I grew up playing with, and it's uh, fortunate that we all became one in, the, in this game from different parts of, of the country, and we all became pretty much baseball brothers, but it was just fun playing with those guys and learning from them and just building a friendship. But the main thing I would say was, wasn't just Little League, it was my neighbors. It was my friends growing up in the in the neighborhood because 
we'll be quick to pick up a tennis ball in the bat and we'll play baseball in the front. Yeah. And everybody yard was our field. You know, it was like our little sports complex. It was our baseball field. It was our football field. It was our soccer field. It was our track field. I mean, anything you wanted to call it, that's what it was for that season. And that's kind of really how I grew up learning how to play. I learned the game. I learned the skill set growing up in the neighborhood. And it was Little League that actually honed my skills together. It gave me that more organized style of play. And from there, man, it was, it was like I said, love at first sight. And then I just started to graduate from there. Looking to support a nonprofit that is making moves? Real Youth Mentoring is a nonprofit organization that provides support to young men across the United States, teaching them to be better scholars, better leaders, and productive members of their community. Through service, scholarship, and engagement, we address the systemic issues that often plague low-income communities while providing solutions rooted in economics and accountability. Visit our website, www.realyouthmentoring.org, to learn how you can join and learn ways that you can provide support. The change we need is here, and the change we need is now. Become a member and a supporter today. Yeah, but the, the biggest thing you said, B, man, you saw you saw somebody, that caricature, you could identify with that person, right? It was a black guy, a black picture that, that was painted up on a, on, on a wall or something like that that you saw passing by. And that inspired you to want to do that for real, like maybe from an organized standpoint. Like you said, you grew up playing in the yard, in the backyard, the sandlot, because y'all played every sport there. So we're going to call it the sandlot. Yeah. But but before, you know, before that, that's what you were doing. And then when you saw that guy painted on the wall, black guy, that made you want to go ahead and pursue that. Pops made you, exactly, man. forced you to make I, that decision. You know what I'm saying? And and, and and you made the decision to play because you was inspired by something. Exactly, man. And I'm telling you, that that was like one of the, the biggest life changing moments for me. Not necessarily because I necessarily have to make a decision at that moment. But like you said, it was that visualization. And I'll be remiss if I don't even mention the name of my little league, Sportsman Little League. We had a couple of big leaguers come out of there, including myself, but more so, we was pretty much an all black little league. Yeah. We Hispanics, man. We was kind of like the the precursor of Jackie Robinson's uh, <laughs> little league. And I know like the predator, not I guess the follow-up of like Gary Sheffield's team when he when their team went to the little league. I mean, we was a bunch of young, black, skillful players who played with flair. We 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 had the crowd who was always just innovative with their cheering, and we made the game fun. I mean, we had some heartbreaks when we got deep into the the tournaments, but I'm telling you, man, it was it was some big time experiences that we had. Some, you know, we felt maybe we've probably been slighted, you know. Yeah. But at the same time, man, I I do truly feel that that was an experience that not too many people get to, get to have. And even to this day, those guys that I played with growing up, I mean, we're all still friends now. We're, we're like a family, you know, kind of just like how you, we are. With, with our high school friends or or with our minor league our minor league brothers like there's a there's a closeness that we continue to have and that's something that i'm really appreciative of oh that's what's up you definitely know building those relationships man it's it's success on and off the field but but the off the field thing is what really makes you who you are how you carry yourself and conduct yourself away from the game and man we you know you spoke on falling in love with basketball first laker fan Magic Johnson, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Michael Cooper, you know, all those guys playing back then with Showtime. And then boom, that one, that one picture, as we mentioned too, caught you, caught your eye, made you want to do it. Pops made you, Pops forced you to make that hard decision, man. Was it, was it a tough decision? Was it an easy decision to say, hey man, I'm done with basketball. I'm going to pursue this baseball thing. It was a little bit of both, man, because I thought I was being slick, right? Cause you know how you say he gonna he gonna let me play basketball. So I'm gonna try to get my way with baseball first, and then when basketball season comes, it's gonna be on. But little did I know that wasn't gonna be the case. Cause you know my dad's pretty stubborn, and when he says something, a lot of times he'll stick with his word. So yeah. basketball kind of hit the back burner. But 
my first year playing, I enjoyed baseball so much that I really, it didn't even matter if I played uh, basketball anymore because, yeah. you know, I knew what I wanted to do. I knew at that moment that I wanted to be a, a major league baseball player. And I had time for other sports. Like, I mean, I would still play basketball with the neighborhood friends and high school. I played a little football and ran track, but I knew baseball was the one, not only that I felt comfortable and knew that I was actually going to succeed in, but that was what I wanted to succeed in because, you know, the odds for us, especially as black players making it is very slim. And I just wanted to, and I'm quite sure you had the same idea. I just wanted to be one of the ones who could say that I made it. Yeah, for sure, man. I mean, me coming from a small town, uh, you're coming from the LA area is a lot, a lot, a lot of ball players, but the fact that you're from that area, South Central to be exact, you know, tough living, you could have easily gone left and, 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 and chosen another route to take, but you stayed focused. Obviously the family dynamic played a part in it. Um, so you was able to stay on that straight and narrow for the most part to pursue that dream, not only on a baseball field, but in the classroom as well, because we know you wasn't a slouch in the classroom coming up uh, to go with the baseball, the, the baseball skill set that you possess. So, man, how old were you when you were forced to make these life changing decisions? How old were you when you? I was eight years old when I actually officially played my first organized baseball so i had to make that decision probably oh, a little bit before, <laughs> little bit before i was eight years old probably around seven years old but i actually got familiar with the game around six yeah so i was still familiar with it but there was like no no desire to want to go play for a team until i saw that that image right it was just kind of like whatever we, whatever we, we were going to play that day in the neighborhood it was either going to be baseball, it was going to be some street basketball, football. We were going to shoot some marbles, play some play some pogs or whatever, man. We, I mean, we was just trying to have fun, man. We was just being kids, riding yeah. bikes and all that stuff. And, and like I said, having that structure and being around other people and that having that competitive spirit um, and seeing that, you know, there's other people who thrived in this game and like you said it looked like me as well too like i couldn't i couldn't ask for more you know and like i said instantly we became a family so that was that was really really i would say probably one of the most important decisions i made and i know for some people it's like uh you know that's not that but that was one of the most important decisions i made in my life and i didn't even realize it at the time it was just me trying to have fun yeah, yeah, that's crazy, man. You, hindsight, you look back and you see and you understand why you're the person you are today because of those things that you were able to do back when you were younger. Um, was it was it instant success when you first jumped on that field and put on that uniform or did you kind of scuffle a little bit in order to find your way? Well, I say a little bit of both. Um, when I first started out playing, I was supposed to play t-ball. I mean, probably yeah. an eight-year-old playing T-ball. Yeah, yeah, you're too old for that, I mean, I'm bro. a little too old, but <laughs> being that that was my first stint of, of playing ball, they wanted to try me out, but they didn't have a jersey for me. Yeah. So they decided to just let me play on the team with my brother until they can find a jersey for me. And the coach liked me so much that they decided to keep me. Uh -huh. And it was like a foreshadowing of what was to come later because my first team in Little League was the Cleveland Indians. And that's what I started out with. That's crazy. So you know, push it back, you know, fast forward to the future, my first pro team was the Cleveland Indians. So yeah. it, it was kind of like a foreshadowing, but I would say that was my first success was actually making the team, so to speak, even <laughs> though I necessarily wasn't trying out. But defensively, I was good. I was cool. Like, you know, that, that was my bread and butter. But I didn't get my first hit to the second half of the season. Oh. And I think <laughs> I, I, if I remember, it was it was my only hit. And so it wasn't <laughs> like I, I tore it up. But once again, it, was, it, it foreshadowed what led me to my success. My first hit was to opposite field. And that was kind of like my bread and butter, you know, coming up yeah. with the alpha. So 
all those things kind of it kind of became who I was, right? Like <laughs> I became an opposite field hitter. I was sort of a late bloomer. I mean, even throughout Little League, like I was known for my defense more so than my offense until yeah. I got a little bit older and I started to grow into my, my hitting. And so where some people, they were more skilled at a younger age all around, I had to work my way into it because it didn't necessarily come natural to me. I know a lot of people think that I have natural abilities, but a lot of it was just me always practicing in the backyard, working on stuff, throwing, fielding, hitting, because it didn't come easy to me. It's one thing playing against your boys in the neighborhood, and it's another yeah. thing playing against the boys in the city. When the lights come on, it's different exactly. when the lights come on, man. It's a totally different thing. So, but like I said, I'm glad I stuck with it. And I think that was one of the ultimate things that, that helped me is that I stuck with it. I never gave up. And even though I would go first halves hitless and oh, that was for the first two years. <laughs> you right. know, I always yeah. finished, I always finished up the second half strong. <laughs> That's what's up, man. That's crazy though. When you you're revealing that and talking about your first team, you know, your first hit defensively being strong mm -hmm. that ended up being you you know much further down the line going through the high school ranks college ranks and the pro ranks and just, and just to say i'm sorry to cut you off but i mean you know i mean they, they used to say i had apple pop and my first home run i was 11 years old and guess where i hit it I hit a twice field man <laughs> <laughs> so, it's kind of like man it was always there man it just like I said, I just had to build a name around it. And yeah. I, I, I think, like I said, man, it was just a foreshadowing of what was to come later. No doubt, man. That's crazy, man. And, but moving along, so you said defensively you were pretty solid. Um, the bat came along a little bit late. When did you start when did you start to turn a corner offensively around what age you, you would say you started to see yourself being a more consistent hitter? I would honestly say around thirteen. I mean, like I said, I was, I was just an average hitter then, but I started kind of becoming more consistent as a, a power, more contact hitter around 13 because I really started to feel the flow. And growing up, I think what a lot of people don't realize is that baseball wasn't an all year round sport for a lot of us. Definitely. You know, we, we did a lot of different things like we're not, whereas now, you know, baseball is all year. And really for a lot of people, it's the only sport they play and they kind of specialize in it. But for us, it was kind of like when Little League ended, that was we it. may play RBI, but a lot of us are probably playing football. A lot of us are just kind of just waiting for the season to start back. And so we're not really practicing throughout the year to where we're honing our skills. So it's kind of like we have to kind of shake off the rust when when season started back and it, it was not necessarily because we were lazy or not we just didn't have that type of uh system and, that and they didn't had have a bread to do the money we yeah. didn't have a system and then it just wasn't a lot of opportunity and and more so we just didn't know a lot of us just didn't know we probably go to the batting cage here and there but we didn't realize it was people out in the valley who were still <laughs> out there playing <laughs> traveling it was like travel ball man that costs a lot of money but now, if you're not playing travel ball, you just ain't playing baseball, period. Exactly. And so for me, like when I got 13, I started playing a little bit more in different different little leagues, different organizations, Jackie Robinson, RBI, Little League, all these different things. And so now I'm actually staying in the game longer, so I'm getting more consistent. And once I start really feeling my power, I became a completely different player. My confidence went up a little bit more and I, I started to become more elite. And so when I got to high school, that's when it really all changed because now I was this contact hitter and it was like, I knew that now it, it, it was gonna be something that was gonna be in my favor. No doubt, no doubt. And you speaking on coming up, man, and nowadays how the game goes, if you're not playing select ball, you're not playing baseball, um, it's, it's, it's such a huge, huge, huge market for select baseball. And for you, man, luckily you was playing Little League because if you ain't getting hits in the first half of the season and you had you was on a select team, you're on a bench. You ain't playing or you about to find another team because you're not producing. It's like 
nowadays the competition is so heavy you got to go out there on your a game as a eight-year-old nine-year-old ten-year-old eleven-year-old you got to be on top of your game every time out there because those other guys are putting in work like you mentioned kids from the valley they got the money and the resources to play year round you mm -hmm. see that a lot now with the game like the kids are playing year round paying for training i'm sitting in a in a in an indoor facility where we do training uh five days a week you know kids are in and out of here every every day you know kids are coming once or twice a week to work out to get better so that's where we are with the game now but let's fast forward a little bit you started mentioning going into the high school ranks uh, mm -hmm. proud of Loma Westchester High School right a lot of great ball players coming from coming out of Westchester High School um was it a big adjustment you started turning that corner swinging the bat around 13 so you was a year or so away from being a high schooler started peaking at the right time uh, what, what type of adjustment because the, the distance of the bases the mound the fields are bigger what type of adjustment did you have to go through leading up into you going to high school uh, and playing at Westchester? Well, I don't think it was much of an adjustment in terms of the sizes of the fields because uh, around 13, we were playing junior league, right? So we started playing on 90, 90 feet. Okay, okay. And things like that. So I was pretty used to that. It was just that it was high school, you know? So now you're trying to do, you're trying to impress coaches. You're, you're trying to make teams. Like I, I kind of quote unquote had my Michael Jordan moment. I thought I was, I thought I should have made the varsity team, you know? And, <laughs> Coach thought I was a good player, one of the best players out, but he was like, yeah, but you're not ready yet. And so I'm just like, man, like, I mean, I can play with these guys. You know, I know these guys. I played with them all my life because a lot of the guys that went to my high school, I mean, went, that we played Little League and also went to my high school. So yeah. we were all familiar with each other. But I ended up starting down in JB and I ended up being the MVP and I uh, won a batting title for our team. And from there, I was like, I'm actually a pretty good hitter, right? And something that I didn't really have that much experience with. Like, I, I started coming into my own around 13, but now I was actually the go-to guy. Yeah. And I think that for me was, it was a learning experience too, because I've never really been that person on a team where people looked up to to be that guy, either to come, in, come up in the clutch and things like that. And from there, I really, I really started to kind of feel that I was an elite player. I knew there were still some things I needed to work on, but you know, it, it, it was fun. And, and, and like you said, you're in high school, you, you got the little girls coming to the games now, you, know, you get the press, you know, you at school, you know, you get to, you know, talk a little mess, like, you know, yeah, yeah, I know you saw me. But I think the one thing I did miss was the fact that I didn't get to play catcher anymore because I kind of, I did grow up playing catcher as well as well yeah. as outfield. And I really missed that. But other than that, I mean, it was, it was fun. I just couldn't wait. I couldn't wait to play varsity because I wanted to see what I can do at the top level because once you get to high school, man, your, your, your sights is on college and pro. Oh yeah, <laughs> and definitely. Even though I was a freshman. It was like, I got to start putting myself on a map to where I'm building I'm building a buzz for myself. And that's kind of really what my focus was. Get better, build that buzz so you can make opportunities for yourself because my main goal was to try to get to Miami. And I was trying to build a buzz to get there. And, you know, I, I had to try to do it. No doubt, man. I'm with you, bro. I mean, you started taking it serious. You know, you started peaking. Started feeling yourself, if I should say a little bit, because you, thought you, were, you, you thought you were that guy stepping on campus at Westchester, even as a freshman, not being intimidated by those guys. I know at the time, I'm, I'm sure Vic probably was, Vic Butler was probably about to graduate. He might've been a junior or so uh, in high school when you got there. Then you had Brandon Watson over there at the time too. I don't know if y'all were in the same class, but I know that's two ballers that went through that school. And there's probably a couple of other guys that were real good that were there at the time as well. But um, I mean, speaking on that, man, you're growing up, right? As we mentioned before, South Central LA, real tough part, real tough area, you know, at, when you were growing up. How, man, speak on, speak on growing up in that type of environment. Yeah, you had mom and dad around and they kept you on that, they kept you on the right path. But again, you know, you seen your mom, you seen your dad, you're around your friends. I'm sure there was some peer pressure here and there for you to go different, 
for you to go a different route, but you was able to stay on that path that that, that you wanted to and, and keep your mind clear and staying out of trouble. But just speak on how, how it was growing up in South Central, especially in your teen years, going into high school when we know that peer pressure is at an all time high. I think by the time I got to high school, it was pretty much all over, right? I didn't already establish, my brother and I, we didn't already establish ourselves as, as athletes. So yeah. we kind of, by that time, separated ourselves from, from the, the gang life or whatever. But the easy, the easy way to see things was that we were going to probably fall into that gang life, right? Because we grew up around it. I mean, just around a corner, you know, you have fighting gangs against each other. And the thing that kept us going was the sports, was the guys on our block and all we played with sports because, you know, we used to have these neighborhood block contests, right? Our block against show block against show block. But, you know, some people on the other block, you know, they was also gang banging too. Yeah, yeah. And one thing that kind of really stood out to me was because when I came back after making it to the big leagues, I remember talking to one of the guys you grew up with, but who was on the other block, man. And I was like, man, one of the things I always just wondered, like, if you guys really, you know, like if it was going to be like this sense of like, well, we ain't messing with him. He, he, he think he better. And he was like, nah, man. He was like, man, we was just proud of you, man, because you making it was like we all made it. And he was like, all that game banger stuff, man. It was like, leave that to us, man. You know, we just yes. want to try, we just want to try to make it. That's why we didn't let nobody bother y'all. And for me, that meant a lot because knowing that we had that support, it made it easier for us to stay on the narrow path because it was kind of like they saw potential in us to the point where they wouldn't even let us stray. Yeah. And for me, that was kind of that was like the family within itself. That was the village taking care of the village, right? Because it's like, you see you see people who are trying to do good. And even though you may not have taken the the path, that the most righteous path, it was kind of like, I'm not going to let these people, these bright stars mess it up with themselves because they can do a lot of good in the community if they have an opportunity. And that was something I, I appreciated because I saw a lot of stuff within the family, outside the family, lost a lot of cousins to the gang life. You know, you, you, you hear the gunshots, you hear the helicopters all over the place. I mean, I was three three blocks away from the, from the LA riots, when uh, hey. the Rodney King riots. I mean, we saw people looting, people coming down the streets with all types of stuff. Sometimes, I'm not gonna lie, it was a little mad, like, why could we get them? You know what I'm saying? Everybody got new shoes and stuff, but. I mean, it was it was times where it was like, man, you know, it was when you look back in hindsight, it was easy to fall into it. Yeah. You know, but like I said, we had a solid crew that kind of kept each other going, man, just with the sports stuff. And that was something that we was really appreciative. And then my brothers, you know, we were so competitive with each other that we didn't even have time to see what was out there. And we was too, like I said, we was too busy running in the backyard playing playing basketball, yeah. city, you know, and all that stuff. So I think that kind of helped us, you know, and I, I think we just wanted it that bad. I know personally for me, I wanted it so bad that I didn't want nothing to mess it up, whether it was at school, whether it was on the field or whether it was just in life. I wanted it that bad that I didn't want to mess it up by by joining the gang or doing drugs or whatever it may be. Sure, man. You, you hear the stories. You hear so many stories. You hear the success stories. You hear the stories that that other other unfortunate that may may have fallen into that life and, and got steered away from doing whatever it is that they were doing. But but the success the success stories like yourself, you know, and your brother being able to stay on that on that straight and narrow for the most part and not really venturing into that type of lifestyle. And to have the, the the big homies or whomever kind of tell you guys, man, this, you know, they, they they didn't put that pressure on you guys or even looked at you differently for not following them and joining those gangs. They actually commended you uh, mm -hmm. for, for staying on that positive road and pursuing your dreams, making sure you take care of business, business and school, so on and so forth. So, you know, you hear those stories, too. You know, I, I can say I was a guy that, that that fell in that type of situation as well, where I had friends all around me 
that were doing that thing, whatever it might have been. You know, for us, it wasn't a whole lot of gang activity, but guys were hustling. You know, mm-hmm. guys were, were getting themselves into, into some things, you know, some petty theft and, and, and things of that nature. I was never pulled down that down that road. And, and, and they respected that because I was an athlete and, and didn't want me to follow that. And I can still call those guys my friends today because of those things. But man, you know, it's tough because everywhere you look, you was around it. You were definitely surrounded by it. And exactly. not to fall into it, man, that's even if even not falling into it for a little while, man, that's definitely a salute to you, your parents, your brothers, and whomever else uh made sure that you guys didn't get involved. So, man, you at you at Westchester. And I think what you grew up in the Crip hood, so you couldn't I mean you went to Westchester there, yeah. Y'all wore red over there, right? Yeah, Westchester colors are red. So I mean it was it was in the it was it was in the family, man. It was it was part of my family history. So I mean obviously, like I said, the easy choice was to go into the gang life. Yeah. Uh, just going back to what you're saying, just with you know, not being allowed to do certain things, I think where the respect came from was the fact that nobody judged nobody. You know, regardless of how we grew up, nobody judged what anybody else was doing. We just respected each other and and, and saw each other as each other's peers. And because at the end of the day, we all were struggling. We was all broke. Yeah. We all ain't had no money. <laughs> you know, because I was trying to eat. Um, you know, we borrowing sugar from each other and things like that, or, or borrowing loaf of bread. I, I know back in the day, back in the day, butter or whatever. <laughs> Anything you need at the moment, you. I mean, I can't even fathom going to my neighbor's house asking them for some sugar or something. Like that. But back in the day, it was, it was like part of life, right? But nobody judged anybody, man, because we was all living the same life, just with different parents. Yeah, maybe yeah. On the block, man. So nobody was better than the other. And I think that was one thing that we could appreciate because what happens is, is it, it's it, even talking about it now, it's like one of those things you could just talk about and laugh about and have a good time. Yeah, about. man. Believe me, I know. I've been down that road too, bro. Man, I mean, <laughs> you know, I don't want to say I had the hardest life ever, right? But I can relate to some of that stuff. You know what I'm saying? I can For relate sure. to hungry nights. I can relate. You know, to not open a refrigerator and saying, well, I guess I ain't going to be eating tonight or <laughs> yeah. you know, just, just missing out on opportunities that some other people have, man. But to be honest with you, man, it was kind of like what we experienced in Little League. You know, we played on the same team. I'm not Little League. I'm sorry, in the minor leagues. Yeah. And it was just kind of like you, you probably, you know, bitch and complain about it while you're going through it. But at the same time, you appreciating it too, because it's like you learning so much and you grinding with, with your fellow teammates. And at the end of the day, I know you remember when we was in Newark and I got yeah. in, we got into a fight with one of the teammates and we, we <laughs> all in the dugouts and we running on the field and stuff like that. But then at the end of the day, we all going out. We go yeah. from fighting on the fighting on the field to we all hanging out. Why? Because at the end of the day, we brothers. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and we loved each other. And, and sometimes that's what brothers do. You know, you, you gonna get into it a little bit, but at the end of the day, you're gonna go out and you're gonna forget about it and talk, sure. talk and about it later. So I think that was just kind of how it was in the neighborhood is that nobody, nobody judged nobody. We all respected each other and we, and we just treated each other as family and brothers. Yeah, that, that's definitely how it was. And like I said, I grew up the same way. You know, we used to go bar or whatever. And, and, and just to just to make ends meet and, and make sure we had something for the day or the night because we couldn't go to the store or if we could go to the store we didn't have enough enough coin to, to, to get whatever it is that we needed so because we had to pay the insurance man or we had to pay the light bill that came first or the phone bill or whatever it might be but um and you want to know what's even funny? The fact that you even say insurance, man. Like, I mean, that brings back so, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so many memories. I remember a guy, I mean, you used to respect him, too, because he was older. You thought he was out uh-huh. of business, right? He was like, oh, the insurance <laughs> man here. Yeah, I don't even know. I don't even know if the insurance man even come to your house anymore and sit oh, down. No, and no, stuff that no. you don't even know about. But, I mean, just, <laughs> I mean, that, that just, I mean, I used to. When the insurance man used to come, like I used to get excited because I used to feel like there was some official stuff going on. It was just really like somebody just trying to, you know, just take your money from you or whatever. But yeah. 
I mean, it's just it's just those things that you remember, you know, growing up and stuff. Man. Oh, are you are you are you used to be the person to answer the door to tell them your mama wasn't at home? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> she was in the room. She was in the room, but uh -huh. but you had to tell him she was at home because he had uh -huh. she didn't have the money. She didn't have the money to pay him that week. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, that's you know, crazy, man. Days right there. Exactly. We're from two different sides of the world, but we do the same shit, bro. Well, that's crazy. Same stuff, man. man. Same stuff. But moving forward, man, you at Westchester, you play, you don't make the varsity squad as a as a freshman, but uh, that following year as a sophomore, were you able to crack the varsity squad? Oh, yeah. Now, you already so, know what time it was. Yeah, I, I, I got made the varsity you. team my, 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 my sophomore year, and it wasn't that I played much. I mean, I, I, I kind of... You know, I, I was splitting time with Vic, you know, he, uh, yeah. <laughs> he controlled center field. He was a senior, but I think, you know, when he was playing, what, like when he would pitch or something, I, you know, I'll go into center, but I, I think I held my own. I batted like 320, I think that year. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, but we had some big bats. We had my boy Brandon. It was like a year, a year ahead of us. But I think we all had our moment. We had our turn, right? My turn was just to learn. My time was just to learn in that moment, right? Yeah. And, and, and see what the guys ahead of me were doing. And then, you know, when the guys who was ahead of me, that was their turn. And then when I became a senior, that became my time to shine. And I, I became the leader of the team. And, you know, I, like I said, I led the team in hitting. And, um, and, and I was the guy, like, once again, that, that people depended on just for guidance. And I think that having those guys who was before me and also having a familiarity familiarity with them, it, it, it helped me grow. It, it showed me how to become a leader. And and like I said, man, it, it's, it's great to learn from people, not only who look like you, but guys who, like I said, you saw from the time that we were kids now up into adulthood. Yeah. You know, and you, and you saw the, not only the maturity level, but you saw the level of play get better. And that made me get better, right? Because at one point we was all kind of equal, right? And then you start, as we start growing into our bodies, <laughs> you're like, okay, okay, this is what we can do. We got, you know, even me, I'm starting hitting home runs now. You know, I got a little power, <laughs> you know, I'm starting to feel myself. And I, I, I started, started really starting to see now the light at the end of the tunnel because now it started to get to the point where, you know, you got to make some real, real, real tough decision. It wasn't just about whether I want to play baseball or, or basketball. Now it's about, am I going to go to college or am I going to go play pro ball? Yeah. Matter of fact, what college am I going to go to? And in those, that's where it became to get, it, it became more serious, right? That's because true. now it wasn't just really baseball fun no more. It became baseball business. It's a business, yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. what I'm saying? And my senior year in high school, it was like a really like a big learning experience because it was one of those situations where my parents didn't really have any idea of, of, of what the process was, whether it was recruiters coming from college or or scouts from scouts. from the major leagues. And so they didn't know the questions to ask. So I was pretty much was kind of there on my own. You know, yeah. they were in the room, but I was kind of like having to facilitate myself because they didn't really know. And so I was learning off the cuff and I wasn't necessarily heavily recruited out of college. I mean, out of high school, even though I was putting up numbers. And so that was even more frustrating with me because I'm like, what, what do I have to do? So I'm trying to find like area code. I played in that. I'm trying to go to perfect game. I'm just trying to get seen. And I'm just like, but ain't nobody showing me no love. And they started really pretty much saying that, oh, you know, we don't think your league is strong enough. We don't think that you know, your conference is strong enough. But I'm like, yeah, but I'm playing against these boys in these tournaments and I'm still doing my thing. <laughs> and and so like for me, like I'm just, I'm getting nervous because I'm like, am I going to just be like the numbers who don't make it? Like, <laughs> you know, am I going to get a chance to go to college? Am I going to get a chance to, you know, even play pro ball? Or I started to not doubt myself, but I started to doubt the process. Yeah. And so I started really just making things happen. I ended up getting an academic scholarship in playing baseball at Loyola, Loyola Marymount. And even from that moment, I'm just like, okay, I'm here now, but I'm sitting the bench. <laughs> you know, like, like what's going on, right? Yeah. And so 
I'm like, I'm sitting on the bench and it's like, I didn't want to be here in the first place. I wanted to be at Miami. And like, not only do I not want to be here, but I'm sitting on the bench and I know I should be playing. And so at that moment, I decided I, I needed to make a change and, and not necessarily because I was mad, but more so because I wanted to follow my heart. Yeah. And so I made that change to go to Miami, man. And that was probably the second best decision that I made in my life outside of, you know, me choosing to play baseball because it not only gave me an opportunity to play at a powerhouse school that I eventually ended up starting at, but it opened up my world to other things like traveling and things like that, right? Because as much as I wanted to do different things, I wasn't used to doing things. Yeah. I never really went nowhere. I never really lived on my own never really been on the East Coast. So now I made this game time decision to just transfer and go potentially leave a scholarship and go to the University of Miami that I've never been to and try my luck there. And I don't even believe in luck, but I was trying it. <laughs> and yeah. I just went in with the notion saying like, hey, well, I'm gonna go play baseball. And I know a lot of people say, Cats on scholarship still still get cut, but I say, well, shit, if I don't play baseball, I'm just gonna play football. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I gave myself a second out, but I went in there and made the team, man. I mean, I know, I know that story just of me going there and talking to the coaches was is a story within itself. But I got the opportunity that they took a chance on me just to be on the team because I didn't even play that year because I had to red, I had to sit out. Yeah, and transferring. Yeah, they took a chance on me, and the next year, I was a starting right fielder. And pretty much, I've been in the starting lineup, you know, the two years that I was there. I mean, officially playing, I've had three years. But I couldn't have asked for more because it showed me at that moment that I was good enough. Yeah. That I can go to a school like Miami and and start. I mean, kind of probably the same way how you felt at LSU. Like, you know what I'm saying? That's a powerhouse school, but you went in there, you know, pitching the College World Series. Hell you yeah. know, I played in the College World Series. It's kind of like, what more can you ask for? You know what I mean? And like, for me, like, that was the dream come true. I mean, and that was even before I got to the big league. That for me was my dream come true. I went to a school that I always dreamt about that I thought was not reachable. And I ended up being one of one of the star players on that on that team playing in the college world series coming from la um not heavily recruited coming out of high school even though you put up numbers played in the area code games so you put yourself in situations to where you could be seen but for whatever reasons you wasn't getting those accolades well not necessarily accolades but you wasn't getting that attention that you thought you probably should have been getting uh because you were playing at such a high level. So tell me this, I mean, you said not heavily recruited. Did you have any offers from any colleges or any pro scouts, you know, interested in drafting you? Did you get drafted out of high school? So I did get drafted out of high school by the Dodgers. And I think the what 38th round? round. 38th? Yeah, and they offered me some chump change. And I was like, I'm not, <laughs> I said, I'm not gonna forego a, a fully paid scholarship. So I had a scholarship paid by, by Boeing. It was an academic scholarship paid through a private company. So they paid my four years of school, gave me an internship and they offered me a job after I graduate. So I'm like, if y'all want to yeah. sign me and not me not go to school, y'all have to give me a boatload of money, right? Because <laughs> I mean, you offer me yeah. 40 grand versus something that's worth over 300 something thousand. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm, I'm that, that's pretty much, I mean, that's just common sense right now. I didn't I didn't have to be experienced in negotiating just to see that that was common sense. Definitely. But I did get an offer and it was kind of like through back channels, like uh, from San Jose State. And where that kind of went wrong was I was on a recruiting trip and I was by myself. I was, you know, my parents was home. And afterwards, I just wanted to talk to my parents about it, you know, to see kind of like, what did they think? And, the coach kind of went off on me. Like, what do you mean? I'm giving you a scholarship and, and you ain't yeah. going to take it or not. And he cussed me out. <laughs> I just said, hey, I just wanted to talk to my parents. I'm, 
I'm 17, 18 years old. Like, <laughs> and, and from that moment, I knew I wasn't going there. Yeah, for you sure. Know, it, wasn't even, it wasn't even a second thought. And, but like I said, that, was, that came like way, way late in the season. It wasn't like something that I knew I had options, right? Because I really yeah. didn't have any options. You know, I didn't know what I was going to do, to be honest with you. I was prepared to pay for school. And then, like I said, just try my luck. And I think the hard part about it was that I kind of just felt like it just wasn't meant for me, you know? And I think that's where a lot of us, a lot of people, especially, you know, in the inner cities, you know, we have these big dreams, but we just don't feel like it's meant for us because we don't see things work out. Yeah. We see, we'll look at other people and we see like, damn, that look like it's coming to them so easily. You know, opportunities and things, doors are opening so easy. And it's like, every time I get to a door, it gets slammed in my face. And then... <laughs> Real talk. And then they get... It's kind of like, like, now I'm thieving the system, you know? <laughs> but I think that sometimes the good part about it is that I didn't mind breaking in your door, <laughs> you know, to get to get to what I wanted. And, and, you know, especially when it came to my dreams, you know, obviously I, I'm not no crook or anything, but when it came to my baseball, everything that I did was back door. <laughs> I had to come through the back door, sure. right? No doors was open all the way from the point to how I got to the big leagues. It was through the back door. And so, if I had to steal my way or thieve my way to the hey, big league, I'm gonna do what I, I gotta I, I, do. I was, I was willing to do it, man. I was willing to do yeah, it, yeah, man. But you you slid something in just a while ago, bro. You slid in that scholarship from Boeing, you know, like that wasn't a big deal. <laughs> uh, everybody that know Boeing, that's a huge company, right? That's that's what with the with the with the airplanes and all of that stuff. I'm sure it's more than just the airplanes and things of that nature, but. I mean, let's elaborate on that a little bit. How did that come? How did, how did that happen? How did you get a, a scholarship from Boeing to go to any university you wanted to uh, on well, their dime? Well, I wouldn't necessarily say any university. So Loyola Marymount and my high school had a partnership. It's a private school, right? Yes. Yes. They had a partnership where with Boeing. It was like a, a, a three-pronged partnership where they gave three scholarships to students from our school to attend Loyola Marymount. So now, granted, Loyola Marymount is right down the street from my high school. Yeah. So obviously for me, I felt like it was a slap in the face that I wasn't even getting <laughs> recruited by a school down the street, right down the street. But then I get the scholarship and now I'm automatically on a team. So that was the slap in the face, like, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How I got the scholarship was I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie, I had my I had my application my acceptance letter to go to Miami in my hand. I was ready to mail it off. I was like, well, I'm going to Miami. I'm walking on. I don't know how much it's gonna cost, but it's on. Oh. And all of a sudden, I get a summons. I get a summons to the uh, 15 minutes before lunch. I get a summons from the counselor's office. And I go to the counselor's office, and I was informed that I was one of the recipients of the scholarship. And I'm not gonna even lie. I tell people all the time, I said, I was the maddest dude to ever get a scholarship in my life. <laughs> I was the maddest dude because I was like, I knew something was gonna mess me up from going to Miami, right? But now I got this full ride on the table that I gotta consider. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, mama and dad ain't gotta pay no money. Exactly. I had to consider it. And it was hard for me to retract that or um, that application to Miami because that's where I wanted to be. But I wanted to make the right decision. And so I ended up taking that scholarship. And like I said, I now I'm being red carpeted onto the baseball team. Yeah, <laughs> you know, hey, as, as if I was a recruit. You're a free athlete. You're a free athlete, man. Hey, the baseball side ain't had to break up. Break a dollar bill to get you there. I'll do nothing exactly. to get you there. So a free athlete. A guy that was drafted out of high school who has a high skill set, of course we're going to bring him on the field. Uh, he, he's going to have to earn his way. Like you mentioned, you didn't play as a freshman, probably thought you deserved it. Loyola was fairly decent in baseball at the time. Pretty good squad, but he ended up taking, you know, taking a step out on faith and, 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 and transferring and going into Miami. Understanding you would sit out your first year, was a starter, team leader, 
those two years you played, got to play in the College World Series. Um, but I didn't tell you, I didn't tell you that, that that experience at Loyola also showed me how to negotiate. Uh huh. Because my scholarship was only supposed to be for Loyola Marymount. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay, okay, okay. I had to finagle my way into getting them to transfer that scholarship. Really? <laughs> and I did not find out. I did not find out because they kept telling me that they couldn't do it. And I told them, I said, well, I'm just going to have to lose the scholarship. Yeah. And me and my boy, we was getting ready to road trip to Miami. Um, he went to Morehouse. So I was going to drop him off to Morehouse and I was going to shoot down in Miami. And literally 30 minutes, it was about it was 1130 at night. 30 minutes before I was getting ready to leave, I got a phone call from the lady that was ahead of like the education department at Boeing, you know, yeah. this kind of shit. And they told me, they said, we just want to make sure that you graduate. And we decided that we was going to transfer your scholarship over to Miami. Man, that's huge. And I, and I, and I, and I will tell you, me and my mom, we had the biggest argument before I left because of that. Right. Because I was leaving and she was, I mean, she said she never said it, but she called me stupid. <laughs> you know, I mean, we were going in. I was like, well, mama, you don't know my heart. I gotta follow my heart. And like, yeah, you being stupid and all that. <laughs> and then when I got that phone call, I mean, we both just broke down in tears, man, and hugged each other. And she was like, I'd never doubt you again. And that right there, it meant so much to me because it showed me that I was growing up. You know what yeah. I'm saying? And, and for the first time, my mom began to, she respected my decision and she knew what I was willing to give up. And, and like I said, it taught me a lot about myself. Like I said, it taught me how to negotiate, but more so it just taught me that sometimes you're going to have to make hard decisions, man, especially when, when it's not necessarily life and death, but when it comes to my baseball career, it was life or death. <laughs> you know, I didn't know yeah, what was going to come when I got to Miami, you know? Yeah. yeah, you're passionate about it, man. And that's a school that you always dreamed of going to. So you had the opportunity. Well, not had the opportunity, but you created the opportunity for yourself to go uh, negotiate it and, and, and kind of convince Boeing to go ahead and transfer that scholarship. I don't know if they've ever done that before. That might have been the first time. I don't know if they've done it since. Maybe not. But 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 we know you're from L.A., man, South Central. Gangsters and pimps in LA, bro. You pimped your way into, <laughs> into getting in that blood, scholarship. Uh, <laughs> it's in your blood. It's in your blood. <laughs> That's what's up, like bro. Said, hey. man, when, you, when you growing up, man, and, and, and you got a finagle, like, I, I was never no, no, no true street dude, but you know what I'm saying? We all, we all knew how to finagle a little yeah, bit. Yeah, you, you knew what time saying? it was. <laughs> we, we, we knew how to put on that little sad face, and we knew how to, you know, get some things we wanted. And, and sometimes you just have to do what you have to do because it was really all about survival, right? Yeah. And so it wasn't necessarily me surviving, trying to put food on the plate, but it was me surviving, trying to save my career and trying to save my education. And I think sometimes you just have to do what you have to do. You may have to tell a couple of little stories that wasn't necessarily, you know, all the way true. Yeah, you're little twisting bit, a little something here and yeah. You have to touch some hearts to the point where, you know, you have to make some moves to be made because like for me, I think if I would have stayed at Loyola, and it's nothing against Loyola, it was a great school, great academic. I just, I just would have been miserable if I would have stayed because yeah. I knew where my heart was, and I had to follow it. And, I'm with you. And, and then, then, then to add to that, they wasn't allowing you to go out there and ball, so yeah. it's like, man, and I'm not even help. playing. <laughs> Why would I even stay here? They, 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 they using me to keep the G, the team GPA up. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, you're one so, of those guys. And so even a funny, even a funny story about that was so when I, so at the end of the season, when I when I was when we had our exit interviews, when I was talking to the coach and I informed him that I was I was transferring. And I think he had a hint that I was anyway, but I just remember when he asked me, he he said, So where, where so what school are you going to? And it was kind of awkward because on the TV, it was the University of Miami and they was beating the brakes off of Stanford toward the one in the championship game. And yeah. I just, it was like, Miami? <laughs> 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 he just gave me that look like, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm out. 
you know, and, and obviously he decided he wasn't going to uh, release me. So I think that was a, a tough part. But like I said, I, hey. got, some good, I got some good homies on, on Loyola. And every time, you know, they saw me balling at Miami, they'll, they'll say something like, hey, y'all see Barton out there? Get that home run. Y'all see Barton <laughs> right in front of the coach just to make them mad. So that just yeah. that, used, that used to make me smile when I used to hear that. Oh, no doubt. Coach was hating on you, man. So you go, you're in high school, bro. Like we said, you get that that opportunity to go to Loyola, Loyola Marymount, down the street from the crib, from the school. Um, you go from playing every day, like I said, getting drafted after your senior year to stepping foot on campus and not getting those opportunities to play. You literally, even though you're practicing and things like that, you literally have two years off of baseball because you have to sit out that first year at Miami, and then you're playing for a powerhouse program in a real strong conference, the ACC, at the time. Um, or was it the Big East? ACC, Big East? Oh, we were we were independent. In independent. Baseball. But you guys are playing. You guys are playing powerhouse program. On the weekends, you weren't playing those slouches. Yeah. You were playing high, you know, you know. We, we were just playing in the sun more often than not. Yeah, yeah, that's it. But, 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 but the thing is, you sit out for those two years, basically, except for practicing, and now you step foot on that field. You're the starting right fielder uh, for Miami, somebody that just just that that's in the College World Series every other year. Uh, was were you like yeah, a bit a bit shell shocked, or did you kind of just hit the ground running? Speak on that experience or when you finally get to get out there on the field and play again. Man, I was just trying to show that I belong, to be honest with you, because even though there may not have been eyes on me, like personally, I felt like, I personally felt like, you know, people were really looking to see like, was he as good as either he think he is or he say he is. Yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, I think I got to hit my first at bat. I mean, that's sort of kind of been not the, the second half of the season. Yeah. Right? You, you know, got, yeah, you that, graduated that's kind of, from that. <laughs> that's sort of been the staple of my career, you know, from from high school on up. I've been getting like hits when I first at bat, yeah. <laughs> you know, even in the big leagues. But I think once I got on the board, essentially, that's when it, it felt like I belong here. I, I can play with these guys because, you know, you, you, I mean, you, like I said, you probably seen it. It was like, it's LSU. But at the end of the day, it was like, I could still play with these guys. You know, yeah. they just, they just average players. We probably played against in little league in the all-stars and stuff like that. But you still kind of want to show that you belong here because it's kind of like, who is this guy? Right. And, and so more so not trying to necessarily prove to other people, but prove to yourself that you belong here. Because like I said, I made a big move and it was like, now I have a, I have, they gave me an opportunity to shine, you know? And I think that that's one thing I will always appreciate Miami is that they gave me an opportunity to shine and they let me shine. You know, we had our ups and downs at times, but they, they, they made me feel like as long as I, I can show that I, I can handle, I can handle being at this level, they're going to let me play. Oh, yeah. And it was up to me to do my part. And I think that's one of the things I appreciate it the most. That's what's up, man. You know, you spend those two years there, big time program. Obviously, academics is pretty high there as well. Uh, you know, you know, sunshine, sunshine, palm trees. You're, you're a little bit further away from home. You can't hop in the car and drive home if you wanted to. <laughs> I'm sure you didn't want to. Yeah, so you really. settled in fairly well, living in Miami, man, playing at that school for that program. Um, when when did it get real, man? I know I know you stayed that two years, but when did you start to see, although you got drafted out of high school, when did you start to see the scouts come around and really show attention or give you that attention and, and, and to let you know that, hey, man, I really have a real, a real opportunity to play professionally? Really, that my first year at Miami because that – I was actually eligible to be drafted because technically I was, I was a, you know, what they were, I guess, consider a red shirt sophomore. Yeah. So, <laughs> so third well, year, basically. Year, so I was, I was getting those looks, but I knew I still had, uh, I, I knew I still had another year to play with as well. And so for me, it wasn't really like, oh, I'm trying to leave Miami. I'm like, I just got here, you know? Yeah. And so 
I started getting a buzz, but in my head, I was like, this is where I'm gonna make my name for myself. And next year is where I'm just gonna blow it out the water, right? So this year, but I think the interesting thing was, was that I began to hear whispers about my academics and, 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 and the scholarship that I had with Boeing and what I wanna do post-career and I think, you know, you mentioned about how I just glossed over my, my, my schooling, but that's why a lot of people never hear me talk much about my schooling because my schooling was one of the hindrances to my baseball career. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and so according to scouts, the fact that I was an aerospace engineer major and that they thought that I wanted to, you know, pursue that, which I did, but after my baseball career, that was their reasoning, they say, for me not getting drafted, regardless of the numbers I put up. So after I heard that my my the, my first year playing, and I had pretty good numbers, started, you know, batted third, fourth. I had an even better year my next year, led the team in hitting, and I still didn't get drafted for the very <laughs> same reason. For the That's very wild. same reason. That's wild, man. And because they said they didn't think I was signable. And obviously, you know, all the people you, you, you feel that could be considered non-signable, I was saying, just draft me. Yeah. And they were saying like, well, you know, I'm not gonna, you know, put all that other stuff out there. But essentially it was kind of like, well, if it's not true, then why would certain people say it? And I said, because you're not talking to the right people. And the right person is me because I'm the only person who knows what I want to do. But lo and behold, I didn't get drafted. And um, I ended up telling my coach that the only way I'm going to play summer ball and get ready for next year is if you send me to the Cape. Because I knew that me going to the Cape would probably be my best shot to get signed by yeah. a team. I had Big no time baseball. Going back. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. Big time summer and, league baseball. That's where all the scouts are. Exactly. Were. And so I went to the Cape and I started out pretty slow, man. I, I was kind of stressing. I was, I was pressing and I took a trip and I had a friend and I don't know the irony, but I had a friend who happened to call me on a time where we had a, a two day off day. Yeah. And she called me and we were just talking and she was like, so what are you doing? I was like, well, I'm in Cape Cod, you know? And I was, you know, I'm saying- Chilling. And she said, really? She said, well, my family got a house in Martha's Vineyard and we're out here on vacation. She said, you should come out. You should take the ferry, which is an hour and a half ferry ride and, and come to Martha's Vineyard. And we just happened to have two days off. It was just all, all perfect timing. Yeah. And I was already stressed and I was already kind of like, you know what, I guess I'm going to be going back to school. And so I took, I took the, I took the little ferry ride and it was probably one of the most relaxing experiences I had. And while I was there, man, I was just kind of like, for one, <laughs> I didn't realize, I was like, the whole time this person I've been knowing from school, I, just, I didn't realize her family was that rich. Got that cheese. <laughs> but, then, <laughs> but then too, it was like, I had time to really think about it and say, you know what, man, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. You just need to relax Yeah. and just go out there and play fun, play and have fun and don't even worry about trying to get picked up. I literally tell you the next day I got back, I tore that league up up until the end of the season and I ended up getting picked up by the Cleveland Indians. I ended up, they ended up asking me to sign as a free agent. Man, yeah. that's, that's, hey man, I, and, and it didn't happen that way for me, but it's a similar story. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't get a chance to go to the Cape because I had signed a play for a team for the central, a team in the Central Illinois Collegiate League. Mm -hmm. um, it was after we won the Coswell Series, but at school, just like you know, a lot of times, uh, these, summer, these summer league teams, they come out in the fall to get their roster set. At least that, that's what happened at LSU. You had a you you were getting assigned in the fall the way you were playing in the summer in the summertime. So I got assigned to play in Illinois. Had a great season, 
the year we won the Cosworth Series. So Turtle Thomas, who was at Miami at one point and came to LSU, you know, he mentioned to me, hey, man, you know, this team in a cake, you know, they'd like to have you. So I'm like, oh, yeah, because I didn't get drafted either. After the year, I was eligible to get drafted for certain reasons, not because of my academics, but maybe they thought I wasn't signable either because I was asking for maybe too much, uh, whatever it may be. Why not, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, um, you know, Turtle tells me this. He's hit, he's I forget the team, but he's 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 put me in touch with the the folks that run the squad and everything like that. And I, I called the team in Illinois to tell them, hey, you know, I'm not going to come. I got an opportunity to go to the Cape. But that didn't go over well. Next thing you know, I get a call from my head coach, Skip Burtman. You know, I don't know for, word for word what he said, but he, but one of the questions that he asked me, do you think you're too good to go to that league to go play where you're committed to play? And needless to say, I didn't get the opportunity to go to the Cape. And if I would have, I think I would have been the same as you, uh, B. I probably would have gotten signed as a free agent. Probably could have made some money because I had another year of el- well, two more years of eligibility at LSU at the time. But I think Skip knew something in hindsight that if I went to that league and, and, and did remotely as well as I did during the season, that I wouldn't be back at LSU the next year. But anyway, this podcast is about you. But it's just kind of interesting I, 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 tell that. Tell your story, man. Tell nah, your story. <laughs> it's kind of interesting that you went that route, man, and was allowed to go to the Cape and and and, and found something after you went on vacation, just kind of relaxed. You went there thinking, man, I got to make sure I go out there and put up numbers like I did during the season against this competition so that I can have an opportunity to sign. Once you figured out you needed to relax, everything fell into place. So obviously they offered you some decent money because you did sign, um, probably took care of the rest of your school, uh, unless Boeing still had that scholarship in place, even though you got drafted, well, not drafted, but signed as a free agent. So talk about that whole process, signing with the Indians. Uh, Now you're leaving sunshine you know, you're in California where the, the weather was always warm, good weather, nice breeze, Miami sunshine, nice breeze, uh, the best of the best of uniforms, travel, so on and so forth. Now you signing with the Cleveland Indians. You're being assigned to a minor league team to where you might have your pants might be patched in the back two or three times. Mm-hmm. You're on a bus everywhere. Um, you know, you staying in. Uh, social hotels, the Mm -hmm. accommodations aren't what they were at Miami. Speak on that first experience, man, when you step foot on that pro field or into that organization. Well, well, my first experience, I know Katz was probably looking at me like, who the hell is this guy? Because, (laughs) you know, know, at Miami, we pretty much get everything, right? But, of course, you know, we had this uh, sponsorship with Nike and, you know, they was kind of breaking into the baseball thing. So, one of the things that's like, hey, if you guys make it to the World Series, we got these new gloves for y'all. Oh yeah, right? I had a Nike glove. <laughs> so we had these white, we had these white Nike gloves, right? And it was like, <laughs> but if y'all go, y'all gotta wear them. So pretty yeah. much, I was like the only one who wore my glove. Everybody else kept their, but I wore mine in the World Series. But that was pretty much the only glove I had, right? You know? <laughs> I didn't really had no agent looking out for me. I mean, I had an agent, but he wasn't really looking out. So yeah. I'm coming to this field with this white glove. And so it's looking like I'm showing out. But really, it's like, this is all I really got. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so I don't know how the first impression was kind of like everybody looking at me like, like whatever. Like, you know. Yeah. But it also was one of those experiences where, and I'm quite sure you felt it, but I ain't never heard any more people talk about what round they got drafted in in my life, <laughs> you know, and how much they signed uh, for. Uh, how hard you throw. Yeah, man. So it was kind of like you hearing all these people talking about, I went this round, I went first round, I went third round, I got 200,000. I'm over here like, I mean, I said, they gave me a little bit of money when they ain't nothing to, I'm going to brag about, but yeah. it ain't awesome. But it's also more than I ever got too. You know what I'm saying? For sure. For sure. And so it, it goes back to, how I felt that Miami was like, now I got to just show that I belong, right? Because it's like, I'm a free agent. I didn't get drafted, so I don't have that story. And so now I got to show that I can go out here and ball and and, and it's just as good as y'all. But not necessarily for them, but for myself, right? Because I knew knew my ability, but it it was fun because when I had an opportunity to show myself, 
like when game time came, I mean, I, I, I mean, I had some soul parts. I had injured my shoulder, so I ended up standing extended. But that was probably a godsend because it gave me a, a non-pressured situation to actually work on my game and get acclimated to pro ball before I got moved up. Yeah. And, and from that moment, and I had some coaches who really took time out of their schedule to work with me after practice that I will always be thankful. I will always be thankful of. And but when I got to low A, I mean, I came out like, who the hell is this guy? Right? Because <laughs> I mean, I was just putting up numbers. And then my first month, I ended up getting moved up to high A. I batted like four something, like in the first month I was there. And it was kind of like, I went from this unknown guy in Cleveland Indians organization to their top three prospect in the organization within a couple of years. And I think from that, I mean, it was just the fact that I was willing to work. Yeah. And, you know, I guess maybe me not getting drafted was my humbling moment, right? <laughs> so yeah. instead of instead of, you know, sitting on sitting on my status, I had to make a status for myself. And so I had to go outwork everybody. I had to, you know, outplay everybody. And I had to kind of, you know, take control of my own my own career because you know, like they tell you, they tell everybody the same story in the minor leagues, but at the end of the day, it, it, it's your career and you have to be able to say, hey, I know what works for me and I'm willing to work with you, but let's talk about it so that we can find a game plan for what is best for my career and, and how you're going to help me get there. And that's something I had to learn coming up in the minor Yes, sir. That's definitely the truth, man. And I mean, you came up in the Cleveland organization. You know, you guys were stacked with prospects, man, especially in the outfield. So it was a log jam. And, and, you, and you said you hit the ground running, tore it up in low A and, and, and got promoted to high A very quick. Um, but you kind of got caught up, you know, in that high A mode for a little bit. Because I remember, you know, Vic, myself and Vic, we were at double A plan. And he used to talk about you and how well you were doing in high A. And, you know, I ended up moving up and stuff like that. And I think, I don't know if it was that same year in like 06 or something like that, that you finally got to get to double A or if it wasn't until the following year. But you kind of got kind of got caught behind some of those prospects that they had that were a little bit older than you have been in the organization for a little bit longer. Um, but, but you finally got up to double A. You produced at every level that you spent in the minor leagues. Um, but it comes to that time where Cleveland has to protect you. Uh, when we talk about the 40 man roster, or you be exposed to the rule five draft, which means another team can take you depending on where Cleveland protected you. That team had to give you an opportunity to play, uh, that next level up or whatever. But Cleveland decided not to put you on a 40 man roster. Again, they had a log jam in the outfield, veteran players as well at the big league level. So they protected you on a triple A roster, which means when the rule five came around, if somebody wanted you, they had to give you the opportunity to make the major league squad. Um, when you found out you weren't protected on a 40 man roster, did you feel some type of way uh, speaking that whole process and that off season after putting up the numbers you had at every level in the Cleveland Indians organization? Oh yeah. No, I, I was really pissed off because in my second year in Cleveland, I probably had my best year out of the whole organization. And my power numbers was up there. I I had 40 some bags. And in my first game, <laughs> once again, I told you, base hit first first at bat, but I got injured. Yeah. I I uh, pretty much you know, my kneecap popped out. <laughs> and so I remember that. I remember I, that. I, I spent a week on a DL and I ended up playing a whole year on a bum knee. And, you know, they rehab me, rehab me. The next year, same thing. Knee was knee was still bothering me, but I played through it because I was like, I want to get to the big leagues. And had a good number, finally got to triple A. And I remember uh Ellis Burks at the time. He was telling me, man, when you get to AAA, man, just keep balling because they're asking, do you think you're ready? Do you think you're ready to get caught up in September? I'm like, 
let's go, you know? And so when I get up to AAA, I mean, <laughs> like my first couple of weeks, I start out, you know, I hit the ground running, you know, like, like nothing ever changed. And then he comes back in town and said they decided that they, you know, they're not going to send you up. And I was kind of like a deflation for me. But then on top of that, they sent me back down to double A. Oh. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm betting like 380 right now. You sending me down to double A. I didn't, I didn't get no reason why. Yeah. I get to double A. I don't play that game. I get back. And then after the game, they tell me I'm going back to triple A. <laughs> right? What? <laughs> like in one day. So I go down, drive my car, go to the game. And I'm going back to triple A. And I was a completely different player. But by that time, I already had in my mind, I said, I'm going back to school. I'm going back to school in the fall and I'm getting surgery on my knee. And <laughs> my real reason was because it was like, I was at a point where I was in my mind done, done with baseball because it was like, I would be fine with letting it go because I realized that at that point, it wasn't because of my numbers. They can't. They they couldn't say that I wasn't good enough. It had to be some other reasons. Well, so, no. but I was like, but I'm going to get something out of this. They're going to pay for something. Yeah. So, and they was going to pay for this knee. So I got my knee surgery. But for them, that was like a good look for them because it was like, well, he got a knee surgery, which they said was worse than what it was. But it was like we don't have to protect him and we can just say that his knee was hurting so that nobody would pick him up. Yeah. So they ended up protecting another pitcher and thinking that they were going to still keep me because they didn't think people were going to be interested, you know, after I get knee surgery. Absolutely. Especially they said I had a microfracture knee surgery. So obviously they said it was worse than what it was. Yeah. But what happened was, is I didn't even know I was rule five eligible. Now, that's a different story within itself, right? Because when I got drafted, I didn't play. I mean, not drafted. When I when I signed as a free agent, I didn't play that year. I signed in 04 because I signed mm -hmm. in August. So pretty much I didn't play that year. So my first bit of, of pro experience was in Instructs. And then I didn't play until 2005. But when they changed the collective bargaining agreement, they changed it to where you're eligible by the date that you signed, not by the first day that you played. Oh. So in that sense, I was lucky that I signed in 04 instead of 05 because yeah. then it would have went from not only three years, it would have went to four years now. Yeah. yeah. Right? So now 2004 counted as a year for me, even though I didn't play 2005, 2006. So now I was eligible. Now this was something my agent did, my old agent didn't know and I ended up and he wasn't he wasn't returning on my phone calls anymore anyway, so uh, I ended up letting him go. But it was it was good because now when I found that I got drafted, and I don't know if you know Wyatt Teragas. I know the name, actor. yeah. I remember he was with Cleveland, right? Yes. It was his agent who actually informed me that I was real fine. <laughs> he wasn't even my agent. <laughs> and so I was trying to figure it out, right? And so when they told me that they didn't protect me. I was like, I'm going back to school. I know I'm going back to school and I'm just going to get this knee right and I'm going to be ready. So when I found out that I was one of the top prospects to get drafted, I was projected to go first pick to the Tampa Bay Rays. And San Diego was trying to move up from second to come get me. So yeah. in my head, I'm thinking like, if they're trying to go through all that, I know I can probably go in there and come in starting, <laughs> you know? So I was like, I was motivated, I was motivated. And then next thing you know, I started hearing reports about my knee and that, oh, we don't know if he's gonna be able to run the same way that he used to and stuff like that. Oh, he had microfracture knee surgery. And I'm just like, I didn't have microfracture knee Cleveland surgery. Cleveland threw that salt in there. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, that's what, Odin, that's what Odin had and that ended his career pretty much. I'm like, I didn't. But that was their way of trying to get people to back off. And what happened was, was teams backed off. Tampa Devil Rays, they ended up backing off and they ended up picking a pitcher. San Diego backed off because they was all concerned about my knee. And the fortunate part was, is that there was a scout who attended a lot of the, you know, Miami games, um, you know, big, my, you know, Miami fan too, but he would see me out on the field 
you know, working out and running. And St. Louis ended up asking him, like, how does he look? And he was like, he looks good. It don't look like nothing's wrong with his knee. And so it gave them the confidence to want to pick me. So I ended up getting picked by St. Louis in the 10th round, uh, as the 10th pick yeah. overall. And I had my opportunity. But that's when, once somebody drafted me in that rule five draft, that's when I said it was over. It was like, it's on now. Now I got my opportunity. I've never been to a big league camp, but now it's like, I got my opportunity. And from that moment, I knew I was gonna make the team because I wasn't gonna let nobody take it away from me. Yeah, that's what's up, man. That's crazy, man. That's crazy, bro. Cause, cause Cleveland wants to try to hold on to you. They didn't put you on a 40, man. So they put that out there that way. He had that serious knee injury. So the surgery is gonna be pretty extreme. You know, a couple teams shot away, but thankfully there was a scout hanging around. You went back to school. If you would have gone back home, probably wouldn't have fared well. Uh, exactly. You went back to school and, and had the opportunity to continue to work out and rehab, you know, with your, with your old university, with the old college in Miami. And, and and being that Miami is a powerhouse, there's scouts at practice all the time. Guy sees you working out, sees that you're healthy, sees that you're strong. Hey, man, he's looking like he's supposed to look. All right, we're going to take a chance on him. So going into the camp, you're playing for who's going to be a future Hall of – he's a future Hall of Fame manager. Uh, you hear different things about Tony La Russa. Uh, talk about that experience in camp, man, when you first got there. You're playing with some big dogs. You know, you got Yachty over there. You got you got Pujols over there and, and quite a few other guys, man. Talk about that experience in uh, your first big league camp with an opportunity to make the big league club. I mean, I was excited, man. Like I said, just – you know, playing with a lot of these guys because coming up in the minors, like we were just happy if they just sent us over for a game to go play up there. Yeah, we, 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 yeah. that, we, we get that meal money. You know, oh, yeah, but, that meal money was always it. And, and hopefully yeah, you, you get some bats and some bats and gloves. <laughs> yeah, you get some bats and bats and gloves over there. You know I what I'm saying? it was crucial, man. <laughs> but, but knowing that now I was actually fighting for something, it was, it was amazing, man, because now it's kind of like, I'm with the big boys now. I get to show what I'm going to do. And the one thing I say I was proud of, and I don't want to sound like I'm bragging, but I was proud of this moment. The only person who outdid me in spring training was Albert Pujols. Really? I was I was pretty much neck and neck with him in batting average. I was right behind him in home runs. <laughs> I, was, I was not not too far behind him in, in RBIs. And it was just kind of like, I'm like, man, I think I do belong here, right? <laughs> but I was still on the bubble because Juan Rodriguez was trying out too, you know, and he was a veteran. I'm just like, damn, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm like, and he had gotten hurt. And once he gotten hurt and he decided that he wasn't going to make a comeback, I, I knew yeah. pretty much that I made the team because I was like, you can't deny these numbers. And I was batting 350. I had about two or three home runs. I had about 12 RBIs. And I mean, I was out there just killing it, you know? And I think that when they finally told me that I made it, man, it was like the best experience. And I remember calling my mom. It was like literally three o'clock in the morning her time. Cause you know, they told me like right when I got to the field and I was like, oh, she gonna wake up for this one. Yeah. <laughs> but like, you know, we all had this moment, like this is what it was all for. You know what I'm saying? And I mean, I know I kind of ran through spring training, but I mean, I couldn't explain it because I felt for the first time that somebody wanted me, you know, okay. and really, truly really wanted me. It gave me an opportunity and and I, sh I was able to show that, you know, I appreciated the opportunity by showing what I can do with the opportunity. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, I'll and you. I think that right there, it meant a lot to me because, you know, we look at these, these statistics when it comes to black players. But then you throw the inner city, or you throw, you know, small town where you come from, and then our eyes go down even, even more. Mm -hmm. And it just, it just keeps saying like, dude, like, it's possible. You know, and I remember when people always used to tell me about that 1%. I, I use this quote all the time, but people always tell me 
how it's less than 1%, you know, make it to the big leagues. And I always say, well, I'm going to be a 100% of that 1%. And that had to be the mindset that I had to have in order to make it because, you know, it's so much stuff being thrown at you that you got, you got to have someone to pick you up or you got to have something to pick you up. You know what I mean? For sure. For sure, man. That inspiration coming up where you come from, like you said, just kind of going through that adversity throughout your career. And you thought you was going to get denied again after putting up the numbers in spring training because you had a veteran uh, that was, that was vying for the same spot that you were. Um, you know, unfortunately for him, you know, he suffered an injury, but fortunately for you, it opened up a door. And a lot of times that's how things happen for, for us athletes. Sometimes guys, you know, some guys, sometimes guys get hurt or, or they don't produce the way they thought they would. And, and now, hey, we need some fresh, some new blood in here. Let's let's give B a chance and see what he can do. Uh, once you found out you, you made the squad, called moms, you know, real excited about that. It's still work, you know, that needs to be put in because you want to stay. Uh, I think around that time, this is 2008, around that time, man, uh, I think Manny Ramirez was the only cat in the league with dreads. Uh, <laughs> you came along, yours were fresh. You just had started growing them. You know, they weren't as long as they are now, obviously, yeah. but, um, you know, you, you kind of set the trend for brothers because everybody got dreads now. Everybody, I mean, Manny, obviously Dominican, but, but I'm talking about black guys you know yeah. black dudes in the league you know I, I know I know um Jimmy Rollins had the braids but to have dreadlocks was totally different and I'm sure a couple of other cats in the league had braids but nobody had dreads mistake yeah. you know let me know if I'm wrong about that well so obviously obviously we all know about Manny but yeah it was me and cut it was me and McCutcheon Cut you know, starting but forward. but you was up before Cutch and was up before Cutch though but it was just that when we were coming up, we both were pretty much same length, right? And I remember yeah, okay. he asked me, he's like, man, I mean, how long it been taking you to grow your hair, man? How long <laughs> it been taking you to grow your hair? And it's like, you know, I'm just letting it flow, man, you know? And and so obviously then you, you see him and I'm like, man, you know, he gets to the big leagues and every year his hair gets longer and longer. Oh, man, and my longer. Mine stand the same length because they keep making you trim it because, you know. Oh, they was making you cut it. They was making you trim it. Well, you know, you obviously in minor league camp, they kept making me trim them. And so I'm yeah. just like, I can't get that flow like I wanted to because, you know, my second year when I was in camp with St. Louis the second year before I got sent to Atlanta, he started getting down here. And so I'm like, cool. But once they sent me back down to AAA, I had to snip them again. Yeah. I'm looking at cuts like, man. I said, oh, man, you know, you 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 living a life right now. You, you got know, that you flow. Flow and everything, <laughs> man. So obviously he... he, he he get the you know the, the notoriety for it, you know having it, but I just think it was just an expression, man. Like I wasn't trying to necessarily make no noise with it, but at the end of the day, you know, just as black players, we have to be comfortable in ourselves, not only our skin, but just in how we express ourselves. And for me, I just wanted to express myself the way I wanted to express myself, and. I didn't necessarily want it to be known for my hair or my dress. I wanted to be known for that person who just enjoyed being out on the field and having fun. You know, no I mean, one of the greatest experiences I've had, and and I know a lot of fans shared it with me too, is just the fact that on opening day, I was out on the field with my video camera, you know, riding around <laughs> the stadium. You know, Come on. I, was just, I was soaking it in. I mean, one day I have to show you the video, but like for me, I was like, this is gonna be my first and only first opening day yeah so why not take it and i have a great story too i know you know we probably losing time but you know uh lou brock you know uh rest his soul you know he used to call me nice. grandson. and that was my man because i remember i'm out here at this video camera and I'm, I'm i'm soaking it all in all the ceremony got the clydesdales and everything not ashamed of it like, no you're not shy not you're not shy all, man. You know, i'm just I'm, I'm out here chilling and i remember uh brock saying man don't you want to be in the camera too and i'm like well you know i'm just trying to get all like he was like no nah, man you know just give it to me and i shirt." and i'm like you sure and i was like all right I said, now don't mess it up. And so I clicked it on automatic, right? Yeah. 
And I remember Ozzy Smith was standing right next to him. He was like, man, he said, like, man, you don't know what you're doing. He was like, man, I know what I'm doing. I was like, all right, Lou. I said, I said don't mess nothing up. I said, you don't have to touch nothing. You know, it's already recording. He's like, cool, I got this. I'm like, cool. So I'm out there enjoying everything. They got these egos out here flying and everything. And, I, you know, after the game, you know, I can't wait. I get home and I'm up here looking. I'm like, ooh, where the ego at? And I'm looking. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, where is this? I'm like, where this ego at? <laughs> I said, dude, this dude didn't touch the record button and he didn't, and he shut off the camera. So <laughs> I didn't get none of that part from the time he had it in his hand. And so I get to the field the next day. I said, Lou, I said, <laughs> I said, you messed up my video camera. I said, you didn't get that in part. I, said, I told you not to touch that. And he just started laughing. But I wasn't even mad because I'm like, how many people could say that they had that experience? Of, yeah. uh, uh, a perennial Hall of Famer who who been so much to the game, so much to the St. Louis organization to have that story to tell about my opening day. Of so course. I wrote about that in my darn book, <laughs> you know? Hey, that's, that's what I it think is. That, that for me, that, 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 would, that, that was kind of one of my, my, my better moments in, in St. Louis that I really, really enjoyed because you, you don't get too many of those moments. No, that don't happen, man. You're talking about, you know, who Lou Brock was once, uh, once the stolen base king until Ricky Henderson came along and broke his record. Uh, Lou Brock also HBCU Southern University. Uh, you know he definitely meant a lot to the game, meant a lot to the St. Louis Cardinals organization. And you had Ozzy Smith right there too, two legends, man. I mean your first your first day at, at on the field as a big leaguer uh, in the regular season, starting out the year, man. So yeah, that's definitely a moment, definitely something you have to share. But man, speaking on that now, you know all of that stuff is out of the way. Uh, were you starting in the? Were you? Did you start your, the first game, or did you come off the bench? How did that all? How did everything started to pan out for you once the season started? Well, I didn't start the first game, but then what ended up happening? The game started, then it got rained out. So uh, officially, our opening day, my my technically my opening day game actually came the next day because they had to, you know, we had to start to play a double header. Yeah. But I ended up coming in as a pinch hitter in about the seventh inning. And I always, I always dreamt about <laughs> doing like our boy Chewy, uh, Charlton Jimerson, you know, yeah. come in first at bat, you know, hit a home run on the first swing, grand Easy. slam. And I'm just like, I wanted to be one of those guys who, you know, first pitch I see hit a home run or whatever. And so I was ready. I'm like, you know, when I see this ball, I'm swinging, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to hit this ball out. And I see the pitch. Two seam red, swing, and next thing you know, I'm, 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 I hit a little dribbler. I wouldn't even say dribbler, but I hit a ball in the six hole, and that breaks and everything. And I'm over here like, damn, you know, round it <laughs> out. And I'm up here running my, and next thing you know, I look and I see dude dive in the uh, in the hole, and as he dive for the ball, the ball hit off his glove, and I'm just like. I got a base hit, my That's first at bat. <laughs> I like, hell yeah. <laughs> like first at bat, first pitch. And I like for me, I was like, all right, it wasn't quite the home run, but that was that that was it. Matter of fact. This is my my, my first well, you got the base hit ball, first, the ball. My first hit, man. They they doctored it up for me. I got my first home run here. Off of Sean Chacon, you probably know Sean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was with Houston, I think, when you did that. And man, I think that, I mean, like that right there, that's when I knew that I was like, I'm official now. Oh yeah, you know, oh forward. yeah. And then I ended up starting uh, the next series. I started the next three games when we played the Nationals. This was against the Rockies, but yeah, man, from there, I was like, I'm a big leaguer now. Yeah, <laughs> you're rolling. You done got your feet wet. You you, 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 you know, you're certified now. So, but man, you know, we talking about that, the first, you know, the first base hit you got, first pitch, you know, swung it out, you know, you know, got it through just past the shortstop out of his reach. Uh, you know, my... I'm a pitcher, but my first base hit was a broken bat single up the middle too, bro. So, <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with it, man. You know, no, you know <laughs> no batting gloves. Look, man, I was pitching. 
against the Mets and I had to hit, you know, I made a start before that and I came out of the bullpen my neck the next my next time around against the Mets. I'm pitching, so I'm gonna hit two. And man, I can't find my helmet. I can't find my bat. My batting gloves, the bat boys, they didn't bring nothing, none of that stuff down to the equipment room. So I'm looking, I'm I have to lead off the inning. So I find one of the other lefties, Tom Gorzolani, I find his uh his helmet. I have no batting gloves. I find somebody else's bat. So I take the first strike, obviously. You know, they tell you take one as a pitcher. Take one. Boom. Second pitch, I swung. Hey, bro. Bat flew into the stands above the dugout on the first base side, bro. Above the dugout on the first base side. I'm embarrassed, man. A bat, I mean, just flew out of my hand in the stands. So go get another bat. Now I got Tom Gorzolani's bat and his helmet on. Next pitch, crack. Broken bat single up the middle. <laughs> my first big league knock. So, you know, you had a broken bat single. I had a broken bat single for our first big league knocks, man. That's kind of crazy. But, man, moving along, you say you got that first homer. You're starting to play a little bit, do your thing, get that flow with the dreads. Uh, anybody who took you under their wing during that first year with St. Louis, any of the veteran players kind of took you under their wing and kind of helped you adjust to being a big league? Well, you know, obviously, uh, Pujols being a leader of the team. He was the one who bought me my first suit. Um, That's what's up. And so I, I always appreciate that. And, you know, Yachty was great. Um, you know, some of the guys was cool, but I will say that it, it, it was a, it was a learning experience. It was a, you know, a culture shock in the, in, in, in the, in the dugout. Cause I was the only black person on the team. Right. So yeah. it, and I mean, I had Rico Washington with me for the first couple of weeks and then, you know, they sent him back down. So it was kind of just me. So I kind of felt like I was on the island by myself at times. I That's mean, I crazy. had guys who, you know, I can I can talk to at times, but like it wasn't necessarily nobody who took me necessarily under their wing to the point where it's like, this is how it is. You know, like obviously, you know, I can, I can kind of fit in a little bit with, you know, with the Latin guys. Um, but at the same time, you know, everybody was kind of cliquish, right? So they, you yeah. know, you had your crew what you were familiar with and it was just kind of me, <laughs> you know, and I'm eccentric anyway, you know, but yeah. I think when Felipe Lopez came later on in the year though, like that was my boy, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because I mean, we was able to kind of vibe a little bit, but I'm not gonna lie, man. I kind of look forward to playing against other teams, especially the Brewers, man, because as you knew, Ricky, you know, they, I mean, Ricky was over had, there, had, Prince they, was they, over they there. Had, they had Bill Hall, they had CC at the time, they had Mike Cameron. You know, then my boy Braun was on the team, but then you know they had uh, Prince Fielder, and then they, and, and, and who else? Uh, Tony Gwynn, I think, at the time. Yeah, you still there? I think. But man, they had all the brothers. So I'm like, yeah. oh, man. <laughs> We 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 gonna we gonna be competing but after the game I'm linking up with y'all. <laughs> you know? For sure. And um but like just things like that, but you know, I knew enough people around the league just from playing minor leagues that I was able to kind of just, you know, vibe with people like if if if, if you know if I just needed someone to talk to and, and stuff like that. Um and like I said, I, I mean, I, 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 I have some moments on the team, you know, that's probably more so, you know, we could talk about it off camera, but yeah, it, it wasn't all glitz and glamour. You know, we, we, we had our moments and, you know, we was, I played in St. Louis in a polarizing time, you know, we were experienced the, the campaigning of what potentially ended up being our first black president. And, you know, there was a lot of stuff that was going on in the locker room that I was kind of like, okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Open your but, eyes to a few things. Yeah. So I think that, you know, those were some eye open experiences that, you know, a lot of people don't really, you know, know what goes on in the locker room. We just see what we see on the field and, and we just assume a person's personality is what we see on the field. And we don't yeah, necessarily know it's that not always the case. outside the field, whether it's good or bad, <laughs> you know, is that, you know, we can't just, we can't just assume for everything to be glitz and glamour because we are, we're athletes and we're making a lot of money and stuff and that, you know, 
there's not emotional components or social components or things like that that's going on off the field or in the locker room or whatnot. So I had to go through some growing pains, you know, like, I mean, I had some issues with, with our manager as well, too. Like, you know, I mean, as much as I love playing in St. Louis, and it, and it was probably one of the greatest places I could have had my first year, like, I also, um, I had some tough times in St. Louis, you know, playing there, just, you know, just trying to feel like, not really feeling like I was a part of the team. Yeah, and then yeah. being a rule five pick on top of that, I really felt like I wasn't that much of a part of the team because I kept indirectly being reminded that I didn't deserve to be there or that I didn't earn, <laughs> you know, my keep, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I'm like, why am I here then? Like I've been, I've been doing what I need to do, but you know, when you hear this through different channels and you know the stories are true because <laughs> because the stories match up yeah. and it's like and I know it's like it's only a few people who would know this, then it, it starts to make you you know feel a certain way and I think that I started to kind of get a little a little bitter at times because you know you understand when you're not wanted somewhere <laughs> you know you start to feel it you know and I think for me like I just had to kind of. I had to kind of roll with the punches at times. Yeah, being the only brother on the squad, you said Rico Washington was there for a while. And then, you know, we talked earlier about the dreads. You mentioned Kutch, Andrew Andrew, Andrew McCutcheon for the for those listening in that, that may not understand that nickname. I know that nickname, Kutch. But Andrew McCutcheon is who he's referring to when, it, when we're talking about growing those dreads and being those, I guess, those, those first two guys in the league to break that barrier and mm-hmm. be able to wear that hairstyle. Uh, you were the first, B, so I, I, I'm going to give you that. You were the first, maybe not as long as Kutch had his, but, but you were the first to, to to wear those dreads as far as a brother goes, a, a black ball player goes uh, at the big league level. But, man, you're talking about going through those ups and downs in St. Louis. You're getting that major league experience but not feeling welcome. Uh, you, you return to the team in 2009, but um, – you get that was 2000, 2008, right? Is when you played in the big leagues with them. 2009, you start out the season there. They sent you, they sent you down to AAA. Then you get traded to Atlanta. How did you get over to Atlanta? Yeah, I got traded to Atlanta in say about the first week. Uh-huh. And but even even to to rewind a little bit, when I was in camp with St. Louis that second year. The worst thing that I could have heard as a player was no matter what you do in spring training, you're not going to make the big league team. That was actually told to me. And I remember telling myself like, well, I'm going to make y'all make me make this team. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And right after I was told that I hit two home runs, I had seven RBIs in the game. Next day I hit a triple and then I don't play anymore. Right. And so that's when I knew the Ryan was on the wall. And I'm like, oh, they really, really mean it. Right. Because once they started talking about me being back in the mix, like, you know, they they had to stop playing me. Yeah. And I know they had their guys coming up, too. And it wasn't that I just wanted the opportunity to show. Just give me a, a chance to play. And I remember the GM talking to me when I got sent down. <laughs> I mean, and how I got sent down is a completely different story. But I remember him saying, like, hey, we're not going to block. We're not going to hold you back. If there's another team who wants who want you, we're going to explore that opportunity because I know you're frustrated. And a week into the season, you know, I wasn't playing all the time, but, I, you know, I started out kind of slow. I mean, I was, you know, first several games, you know, probably had a couple of hits, but wasn't tearing it up. Yeah. And we go to Oklahoma – and for the first time, I meet my grandfather's side of the family. So, you know, I invite him <laughs> to the game. And, and the first game, I got kicked out the game because, <laughs> you know, calling balls and strikes. The ball almost hit me, I thought. And, you know, he called it a strike. So, you know, I got kicked out. So they don't get to see me <laughs> play that game, <laughs> you know, because it got late. And then the next day, I found out that I got traded. And so they come to the game again, and I'm sitting in the uh, stands. Yeah, you're in the stands. <laughs> right? And um, and even how I got 
traded then was it, like I felt like it was disrespectful. Like you know, I'm, I'm I, I get handed the phone while I'm taking while I'm shagging in the middle of the outfield, and next thing you know, I'm to the DM in the outfield telling I got traded, and I had this long walk, <laughs> you know, to the dugout, right? Like, and I'm just kind of like. So many times I've been disrespected by the head coach in the big leagues, by the head coach. <laughs> like, Everybody. You know? But when they said Atlanta, I said bingo, because I always wanted to live in Atlanta anyway. Yeah. I had my opportunity and I was, I was excited to get a new, a new chance. No doubt, man. And, you know, you get that opportunity. You're living in Atlanta now. Uh, as you say, you always want to do that. Get that opportunity you get a little big league time with atlanta man uh probably a little bit a little bittersweet just based on adversity you had to go through even to get that chance to play in the big leagues with st louis and, and you know it seems like every single time you you feel that you're starting to hit that stride and and, and really earn that keep someone is trying to knock you down um and i know how that feels obviously i have my own story for another episode but <laughs> but but you know, you go out there, you spend some time in AAA with ATL, you get called up to the big leagues for a little bit there, and then, you know, you make it through that season and have an opportunity the following year with the Dodgers, right, to, to be that fourth outfielder. Things didn't work out uh, for whatever reasons. We don't know. And, and I finally get to meet you that year because, uh, we, you know, we, we grinded in independent ball and, <laughs> and, you know, we bounced around those leagues for a couple of years, man, and then you know, you get another opportunity with the Reds, play triple-A ball, and then just kind of essentially that, that career starts to slowly come to an end, even though you're still playing. You're not getting those opportunities that that you probably deserve based on the body of work that you've already put together through your minor league career and the time you spent in the big leagues. Um, by then, you've completed your degree, I want to say. Uh, already graduated not not, not uh, quite yet but not I'm quite yet <laughs> so, so you're almost you're on, you're on yeah. course to finish but but during those times man you start to write that book that first book uh what gave you the inspiration to write your first book i actually wrote that first one when i was in st louis oh okay um, well i actually said i started writing it when i was in st louis my cousin um i met him for the first time uh my mom's first cousin and i wouldn't say first cousin second cousin but um, when I met him, we were talking just about all the stuff that was going on in life. And, you know, he was a big activist in his community in East St. Louis, which is on the other side of the river. Yeah. And, you know, we were just we was having a good conversation just about, you know, obviously he was my sounding board in St. Louis because, like I said, of the dynamics. And, you know, he's very in tune with his, you know, his community, very in tune with, you know, black progress and black excellence and we were just chopping it up and you know i was just telling him about you know my wanting to write a book and i've kind of given him the gist of what i wanted to write about and but i was like i don't necessarily know if i feel like qualified or or even if it's the right timing and all i remember him saying was ain't no better time than now and from that point when he said that when i got home i picked out the pen and paper and i just started writing yeah you know, and because he was right, there was no better time than now. And I didn't have to, I didn't have to doubt my story, right? Because I'm not necessarily trying to compare my story, my knowledge, my experiences with anybody else. I'm just sharing my story, right? And I'm sure. sharing whatever insight that I could give, right? I'm not trying to compete with Barack Obama's book or I'm not trying to compete <laughs> with, you know, Malcolm X's autobiography or whatever. I'm just telling my story right because i do have a right to share my story and i do have i do have an experience just like you have an experience and anybody else has an experience everybody has a right to share their stories and nobody should be able to tell you why is your story important yeah. because it's what makes you who you are that's why it's important and so when i started writing that it just really it really started to help me get things off of my chest that, you know, I knew helped make me who I was. And yeah. it's not quite my autobiography, but it's really my mindset, yeah. <laughs> right? It's, so, my, so, it, it's who I am. 
So give us the title, man. Give us the title. I know that I know folks can probably find that book online. I've read it. Uh, what's the title of that book? Well, the yeah, book I got is called Mindset, Awareness, and Action. And essentially, it's about you know how I develop, you know, my mindset just dealing with life and different areas and components. And I try to just talk about the different issues we deal with it in different components of life and and how to just how not only I overcame but just the importance of overcoming. Them. And because ultimately we, whether you're black, white, or whatever, you're going through stuff. And in order to get to the next level and whatever you want to do, whether it's overcoming your neighborhood or whatever, you have to put yourself in a mind frame that, that helps you take the best steps to navigate that, you know, because life is really just about navigating the waters, <laughs> you know what I'm okay. saying? And if you don't navigate it right, you would drown, you know? Or, okay. And, and ultimately, you know, you know, we, we just we just a bunch of swimmers, you know, <laughs> trying to get to shore. And, you know, sometimes you're going to have to ride the current. <laughs> sometimes you gonna have to catch some driftwood, <laughs> you know, sure. but ultimately, <laughs> we're trying to get to the shore. And, and, and really, that's kind of what mindset is about. That's what's up, man. I read the book, like I said, years ago. Definitely enjoyed it, especially because I know you. Uh, just kind of reading that, reading that, and, and understanding your story, and being from a little bit more familiar with where you came from, and, and the things that you did and accomplished, um, you know, throughout your career playing pro ball, became that world traveler, uh, added author to your resume, still that world traveler, uh, that major league ball player, you know, you, you, you're well rounded in that sense, man. Uh, you actually have two books, right? What was the second book, and when did you write that? One? What's the title of that a second? A couple of years after, and the second book is called "Stats and Situations: The Game Plan to Success." I don't know if you can't really see it. There you go. Yeah, I can see it now. And yeah. really, this book kind of it talks about. It comes into it, it's a baseball book in a sense, right? Where yeah. now I take my experiences from baseball and show how they apply to life. And I know baseball can be full of cliches, so I kind of tried to stay away from cliche, but I really want yeah. to show how different components of the game, whether it's how we deal with our stats or how we deal with game situations and show how they coincide with life, right? So I kind of, you know, I share that Lou Brock story in the book too, but how I break the book up is I, I break them up in halves, right? Each chapter, you know, I give a story about you know what I want to talk about, then I get how it applies to baseball, my baseball experience, and then 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 how it applies. Then I use that same concept and give you another story, a real life story, and how it applies. So now you're not only learning about the game if you don't know the game or if you're familiar with the game, you can relate to it, but then you're seeing how it's directly being brought and put into life, and you're seeing how it affected me in life using the same concept. And so I, I use that to kind of break down the game a little bit, but also just to to show you that baseball within itself is the game of life. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. I, that's some things that I talk about working with some of the kids, you know, here at the facility, even before I got the facility, just being able to let them know the things that you learn, not only in baseball, but in a team sport, any team sport, it's life experiences. You're learning how to navigate through life in a sense. Never, I never downplay school, but you're getting more out of playing these team sports than, than you would get in school because those team sports, everybody's held accountable. You know, you can get away with a lot of things in the classroom, especially if you're working on group projects or, or you can always lean on somebody to help you through it. A lot of times in sports, you can't really afford to do that. You know, if you don't hold, hold your end of the deal, it shows. Uh, so yeah, definitely, man. I, I definitely need a copy of that that second book. I never got a copy, never had a chance to read it, but it'd be cool for me to have something to share with some of the kids here at the facility. So you'll have to let us know how how we can get those books, man. Uh, before I let you go, though, I, I have a few questions for you before we shut it down. I know you're planning another trip to Senegal and stuff like that. So you, yeah. man, you're all over the place, man. I already bought my ticket, man. All over the place, man. But um, you know. First, let us know, man, are those books available online to purchase? And if so, where? Yeah, man, you, are, you can get it off my website at www.brianbartonaccess.com. Brian Barton Access. And I got both of them available. I'm working on another one. 
as we speak and you know just trying to get more content out there and you know just trying to continue my speaking and everything i i enjoy you know just spreading my word and spreading yeah. insight and my experience just to help other people not even just athletes but just other people you know get to the next level in life and like if i can do that and continue to help i mean i will you know we all we both experienced coaching you know overseas yeah. i mean i mean just teaching people i think that's something that we all have a gift you know if we just use it because once again you know we all have experiences and with experiences we become teachers and i think we should use that oh no doubt without a doubt man brian barton access.com right b-r-i-a-n b-a-r-t-o-n access a-c-c-e-s-s -S -S dot com go ahead and check out the website order both of those books we got to get this man a new york times bestseller with the next one, that third swing at it we got to get you on the map with those with these books man it's got a lot of great information you do a lot of public speaking as you said um if you need to book him you'll probably book him on his website as well uh he's he's spreading that knowledge and sharing the wealth with, with not only kids but adults uh because because we all have 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 things we need to get on work on and improve on and, and, and need that extra guidance from time to time to succeed in life but b man it's been a great episode of the league talk podcast bro i can't let you leave just yet a couple more minutes i got about five questions for you man and then we're gonna shut it down uh just think about the young b the young brian barton when you when you're answering these questions man so uh, five of them. Hopefully you got some time for me. We're going to knock them out and then I'll let you go, man. So uh, I'm going to start with the first question. Man. I'm going to start with the first question. You like playing home at home or on the road? Road. Road. Yeah. Why? Tell me why. Share, share one reason why. I like playing on the road. I mean, home is the easy way, right? But I like playing on the road because everybody want to see you do bad. And I think that's uh, like, yeah. Yeah, same here, same here, man. I'm with you on that one, bro. So let me ask you the second one, the second question, man. Did you have any superstitions or certain routines you had to uh, go through to prepare yourself for a game? I don't necessarily believe in superstition, but I lived and died off the tee. Um, uh -huh. there, there was a point where I didn't like taking batting practice. And so it goes back to what I was saying, taking control of your career. And it got to the point where I... I told our farm director when I was struggling one time, I don't know if it was necessarily an excuse, but he was like, so what's going on? Like, I mean, I see you in a little slump. I told him, I said, I don't like taking batting practice on the field. That sounded <laughs> stupid as hell, but <laughs> they bought like, it. Well, whatever you need to do. I said, I just want to hit off the tee. <laughs> he was like, well, whatever you need to do, get right. And I got right. But like I said, man, like the tee was, the tee, if, if that was a superstition, then that, that, then that pretty much was my, it was the reason why I was able to do what I did in my baseball career. No doubt. That's what's up, man. So I got three more for you, bro. I'm going to hit you with this one. And I added something to this question because mm -hmm. I asked it to a couple guys and, and, you know, they gave me their answers. But but I'm going to give you a bonus. I'm going to give you a bonus option. Um, nachos, chili Fritos or a hot dog. Now let's let's take it back to Little League. Let's take it back to Little League. Chili Fritos, and I'm gonna tell you why. And <laughs> the thing is, is I don't know if if, if if you really if you really from the <laughs> from the soil or you really from you know <laughs> from the hood or whatever, you go you gonna get the chili cheese Fritos in the little. Oh, for sure, for you know, sure, in a Frito bag. Yeah, that's, that's, how, you that's how we got it. Bag, <laughs> if you don't have it in the bag, then, then it don't count. Oh yeah, that's how we got it, man. Out the bag, they cut the bag open, uh, or, or they just open it from the top, and you know your yeah, chili and cheese and that thing. Good. Oh yeah, but I was a nacho guy. I got on the chili Fritos a little bit later on, but I was a nacho guy, man, with chili cheese and jalapenos for me, bro. Chili cheese and jalapenos for me on the nachos, but you know, with the nachos, uh, you gotta you gotta let it. I love that one nacho that got real soggy. soggy. Oh, yeah. Soggy, like, good. <laughs> <laughs> like, For sure. You kind of play, you, it's like, so you hope they put enough cheese on it just oh, so, yeah. it, so it can soak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same here, dog. Same here, man. So uh, two more questions. I'm going to let you go, bro. I'm going to save the best for last. But 
uh, anybody you hated facing or enjoyed facing in the big leagues or just throughout your whole career? Somebody you like, man, I hate facing this dude or man, I can't wait to see this cat. Hate hey, facing your ass. Uh. <laughs> no, nah, because it's like, you know, you face your, you, you face your boys and you know, and, and matter of fact, I'm not going to even just say you, I'm going to say all my boys I hate to face because I feel like they all got the best of me. Not necessarily because we, we they were that much better or not. It's just that, yeah. you know, bragging rights, man. So oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Damn. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I know I got you a few times, but, man, yeah. I think you got me more than I got you. So oh, I'm yeah. like, damn, you know. It's only as good as your last, your, your, your last at bat. And I think, especially when, when um I think, you know, when we when we played together or you kind of figured you figured that cutter out. Yeah. And that, and that really kind of gave you that next level to go to Korea. I mean, once you got that, I couldn't touch you no more. You know what yeah, I'm that, saying? That was an equalizer so right there. Moving, I was like, oh man, <laughs> you know, I met you, my boy. So I'm just like, okay. And so, and like even my boy Tony Sip, you know what I'm saying? Like the same thing. I couldn't hit him, not because he was like he, he just overpowered me. I couldn't hit him because he was my boy. And it was just yeah. like, I just felt like we was trying too hard. But um, as far as like guys, I hated. Or oh, guys you enjoyed. Who you enjoyed facing? Like who? Is, is it anybody that stuck out to you that, oh man, it's going to be some good hit in the day if that dude was um, on the mound? Man, it's funny because I was just looking at this. I don't know. I don't know his name. Let me see. I was looking up, we were playing Altoona, right? And it was this picture right here. And I happened to find this one. Uh-huh. And I hit this home run in the playoffs. Um, it was a grand slam. And that's when I was in Akron. And whoever it was, it was a closer. Um, but it was pretty much, he hated facing me. I had two guys like that. He hated facing me because every time, they threw hard as hell, but every time I faced him, I was like, I'm about to go tear his ass up. <laughs> I love facing his ass because I knew he was going to give me something right there. I forget his name, but I can remember his face. And I'm just yeah. like, every time I saw him, I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> he already know what that time was it. it was. So, I mean, it was a lot of, I mean, obviously, most of my career was in the minors. So, it, it, it was, I pretty much loved him off that whole <laughs> The whole minor league system, especially. No doubt. No doubt. No doubt. Well, I man, I got one more for you, bro. I got one more for you. I'm going to let you go, bro. Uh, favorite athlete of all time? Man. Well, can I give you two sports? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We could do that. I mean, because I know a lot of people miss him, man, but Kobe was my boy, <laughs> you know, and it. I don't care if you think he was one of the greatest, the greatest or not. Like to me, he was the greatest, you know, and I and I have a right to my opinion. And it was, he was one person that I always wanted to meet, you know, and I never had the opportunity. Um, but he, I mean, he changed the game in many ways. I mean, there was a lot of people who changed the game, but he did. But when it comes to baseball, man, you can't, Man, I, you can't you can't go no other than Barry Bonds, man. I mean, when you, I don't care what people thought about him and how people feel about his numbers. The one thing I will say is when he was hitting, everybody stopped and watched. Oh yeah, and you have to be, <laughs> you have to be a right. health player to be able to do that. Yeah, and so when somebody can talk mess about you, but then still so stop just to see if you was going to hit a home run or strike out, whether they want to talk mess or not, then you must be that good. And so oh, yeah. I'm going to say Barry Bonds for that. We can go all through sports, but. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Teams. I mean, Griffey for me, obviously in baseball, just, just with that lefty, even Bonds, he's a lefty too, but mm -hmm. you know, Griffey was a different beast, but yeah, it, uh, you definitely can't go wrong. If you choose somebody like Barry Bonds, man, yeah. Kobe you Bryant, go, same like you way. Said, you can't go wrong with, with Griffey. You can't, I mean, you can't go wrong with a lot of people, man. Yeah. But like I said, a lot of it's preference. But I think what I loved about Barry was that he didn't get intimidated with the pitch count. He didn't care if he was 0-2 and you had a dirty slider. It's like, man, I'm still not going to swing at it. Yeah. <laughs> now, I'm going I'm, I'm to make you throw me my pitch. And by seeing his approach was the reason why 
I would tell myself when I had two strikes, I'm not looking nothing but for something down the middle of the plate because I'm going to make you throw me a strike. You know, I know they talk about protecting and all that, but I'm like, if he can do it, then why should not be trying to look for the same pitch? Yeah. Because ultimately, in or- <laughs> you still got to throw a strike for me to hit it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? For sure. Like for me, I, th- I think that was like the ultimate ultimate player in confidence that I- I've seen in-, in any bit of sports. That's what's up, man. B, man. That's what's up, man. Look, we finally got to hop on the podcast, man. Got you in the United States of America for a short period of time. I know you're about to take off again. So I really, really appreciate it, man. You know, you, you stopped through, you, you, you shared your story, you dropped some gems, how you persevered through the adversity, kept kicking that door down to get that opportunity to play in the big leagues. You used that and parlayed it into writing a couple of books, being able to travel the world, being able to speak to, to, to different types of people from different walks of life to share your story and to also motivate them to pursue their dreams and to continue to focus on the things they need to do to make it to where they want to be, bro. So, you know, well-rounded dude, athletic, you know, athletically, you know, intelligence, militant, uh, you know, still rocking the dreads, man. So again, bro, I appreciate you coming through. This is the League Talk Podcast, and we out of here.